going to talk about the heart and myositis. It is. We all good? Oh, maybe I should sit down. I will have to sit down. Can you hear me better if I do this? Oh, no. I have to sit. Oh, mobile. There we go. Great. I was born with too much energy. OK, this is great. Can you hear me now? OK, so we're going to talk about the heart and myositis. Uh, this is an area I've been working in for probably the last 15 years. Uh, we do a lot of work in atherosclerosis and have a lab at UCLA. We're not going to talk about that today. We are going to talk about some things very relevant uh, to the clinical care of patients with myositis. We're going to start with the basics, and this may be too basic for most of you, but the basics on the heart and a little anatomy. I have to like put my lips to the microphone. Can you hear it now? Yeah. Okay. We're going to go over some basics of the anatomy. Then we'll look specifically at cardiac involvement in myositis. Uh, we'll talk on management of cardiovascular risk as well as known disease in myositis. Um, and then questions and discussion. Um, I did an online chat for TMA several months back and we really ran out of time to get all the questions answered. So I'm only going to chit chat for about 15, 20 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for your questions uh, after that part. So this is the heart. Uh, and the heart is a muscle. So it's not surprising that it is very important uh, to talk about the heart and myositis. Uh, the heart has a big job. This is the muscular part. And what's happening is your blood is coming from the rest of your body through the inferior <coughs> and superior vena cava. It's been deoxygenated because your organs have used the oxygen. It comes into the right side of the heart, which goes out to the lungs. The lungs are needed to oxygenate that blood, right? That you used all the oxygen. Comes back into the heart and the left ventricle pumps it out to your organs again. You need oxygen for your entire body, right? Your kidneys need it, your brain needs it, and the heart is the guy that pumps it. Now in this picture, I've shown you the muscle. These are the vessels pumping the, the blood out of the heart. These are coronary arteries and veins in that fascia there. They supply the heart muscle itself with oxygen. They are very important to keep that heart muscle happy. The other thing we have to know is that in this heart muscle, there's electric wiring, right? That's what I'm going to call it. Your muscle has to contract according to a very set pattern, and the wiring is needed to make sure it pumps efficiently and gets that blood to where it needs to go. All those things are very important. So what happens uh, in patients with myositis. Not all, but a surprisingly larger portion uh, than most people think uh, is that you can get inflammation in that muscle itself. And inflammation can lead to fibrosis of that heart muscle. And if you fibrose the muscle, two things can happen. Arrhythmias, where the heart is not beating normally. And I was talking two minutes ago about that circuit tree, that electrical circuitry. And if you have a big scar right in the middle of one of your circuits, your heart is going to beat irregularly, might quiver. Very serious arrhythmias can lead to death instantly. The second thing is if you have fibrosis in different areas of your heart, it's not going to contract normally. So normally you should have an injection fraction of about 50 to 60%. If you've got scar in different areas from prior inflammation, it may only contract at 10 15%. The fluid that is supposed to be going out of the heart, that blood, is going to back up into the lungs. You'll get fluid in the lungs. It's going to back up into your other organs and into your tissues. You can get lower extremity swelling, uh, most common in congestive heart failure. So is the inflammation that I'm talking about in the heart the same process as that's in the skeletal muscle? It's a good question. Not everybody gets uh, involvement of the heart. There is surprisingly little data uh, to tell us about that. It shouldn't be surprising. It's pretty hard to get tissue from the heart. This is kind of fuzzy and hard for you to see, but I wanted to show you exactly what we look at. Um, 
in dermatomyositis. And this is skeletal muscle, um, but I have a point here. So one of the things when we look at a muscle biopsy, which I know many of you have had, and we're looking at a patient that we think has dermatomyositis, and I'm gonna choose that because of what I'm gonna show you next. We look for a classic finding called perifascicular atrophy. What the heck is that? So this is a bunch of muscle fibers. These guys, here's the outline of them. They're nice and big and juicy and thick. They're normal. At the edge, and this is all a fascicle. At the edge of that fascicle, which is what is here in yellow, you see how small these guys are? They're tiny compared to these big, thick ones. That's perifascicular at the edge of the fascicle atrophy, okay? The muscle fibers are atrophying, and there's often a lot, oftentimes a lot of inflammation there. That's classic for dermatomyositis. And it's thought to be related in itself to a vascular process, a vascular dropout, kind of watershed area. We won't go further. Why am I showing you that? Well, this is one of my patients I saw a couple of weeks ago. This is his left thigh muscle. Shows you the same thing that I showed you in the other picture, just a little bit more aggressive. Here at the edge of the fascicle, all the inflammation, and you see these tiny fibers, right? So, the next picture I'm gonna show you is a piece of muscle from his right ventricle. Now, the most important thing to tell you right now is that that patient of mine plays basketball in LA about two hours a day, and he's doing just fine. Um, what I'm pointing to is the fact, and it's hard to see here, but you gotta have some faith here. These guys are little, and you see all the inflammation at the edge, uh, this peripheral zone of the heart, just like we saw in his skeletal muscle biopsy, right? We published this about a month or so ago, it's, and we did a whole bunch of other fancy stains that I'm not gonna show you, to convince reviewers that it was the same process in the heart as it is in the skeletal muscle. That's the point I wanted to make. And this is again showing you right here at the edge uh, zones, you have these fibers that are getting smaller and smaller compared to the, the big fibers that you should have in a heart muscle. So is the inflammation in the heart the same as the skeletal muscle? You know, not much data, but some of our recent work suggests yes. Okay, I mentioned in the first slide, you need blood vessels to supply oxygen to the heart muscle. And so these are your little coronary arteries and veins. Very important, right? Because the second problem that patients with myositis get is they have an increased risk of early atherosclerosis. So blockages in the heart, hardening of the arteries, the common terms uh, described. This is not unique to patients with myositis. Patients who have any inflammatory disease, and we're learning more and more um, every year and every day, uh, patients with lupus, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, which is very, you know, one to two patients per hundred, so it's a much less rare disease, have an increased risk of atherosclerosis, and it's related to the inflammatory process. But if you have insufficient blood flow to that heart muscle, you're going to have the same problems. It may be called a myocardial infarction, right, when there's a complete blockage. That muscle then dies and will scar, just like if it were inflamed. Uh, that will lead to fibrosis of the heart muscle and those problems with the circuitry, the arrhythmias, and potentially even the heart failure, right? Same process, uh, different uh, cause. So this, this one, I'm sorry, this is a bit small. We did a survey several years, years back uh, with a group called the International Myositis Assessment and Clinical Studies Group. Many of you may be familiar with this group. It's called IMAX. It's a bunch of muscle geeks like me across the world, and we all get together at like 6 a.m. at our annual rheumatology meeting. <coughs> and we surveyed these experts on heart disease in their groups of patients with myositis. So the data represented about 1,600 patients with myositis. Not a perfect study, it's a survey study, but it was the first one who tried to get some information from experts about heart disease and myositis. We were pretty surprised, about 70% of those experts said they had patients with known stroke or myocardial infarction. So they at least had one patient, right, with that problem. And even greater numbers uh, of those specialists said they had some patients with some type of vascular disease. 
So what do you do? Um, it's pretty boring, it's pretty basic, but I'm surprised, uh, I'm not surprised, I should say, you know, when a patient with myositis comes to their doctor, they've got a lot going on. There is a lot to talk about. Uh, there are medications to go over, how are you doing, what's happening at home, how are you managing, and so I think the cardiovascular assessment often gets kind of pushed to the side, and I don't think it gets done as much as it should. There are basic things uh, that should be done for everyone, um, and particularly for patients with myositis. So a clinical history, family history of cardiovascular disease, very important. Genetics are a powerful thing, and whether you have myositis or whether you don't have myositis, if you have a strong family history of coronary disease, meaning heart attacks and strokes, you need to be screened. Hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, and smoking. I've only got one word on that. If you're smoking, stop yesterday. Um, and then all my patients that I see always get an EKG and an echocardiogram when I first see them. EKG is looking at that rhythm, right? And the echocardiogram is just an ultrasound goop on your chest and to see how that heart is beating. Is there any irregularities? Those are easy tests. You can't leave UCLA without getting those or at least showing that you've had them so that I can get uh, the copies of those. Now, additional testing, and we just finished a, a review article on this, and we'll go through a little bit of a diagram. It's dependent on the initial testing. If there's a real strong family history of heart disease and uh, myocardial infarction and stroke, there are stress tests and good cardiologists who should see you. Um, Holter event monitor is referring to if you have a very abnormal EKG or a slightly abnormal EKG and you're getting dizzy episodes, there's some irregular palpitations, they can put something on you, not unsimilar to this, to see if you're having any significant arrhythmias. You want to find that out before you have a really bad one. Um, stress test I mentioned, MRI is something, we won't go into it, but there are newer MRI techniques that can actually look at whether there's inflammation in the muscle of the heart or whether it's damage related to vascular disease. Okay, so this is another question we uh, gave to this survey study, um, is how many myositis specialists check lipid panels? About half of them do. And I know my patients a lot of times don't like to go to their primary care doctors because they're seeing me all the time and while I'm okay, I'm not that great, and they don't like going to doctors. So it may be important that we are actually checking them and that you, as patients, are saying, I gotta get my lipids done. And the whole question of what to do with those lipids, I know is a scary subject, and we're gonna get to that. Okay, so management of heart risk and disease. So controlling my myositis is paramount. Um, prednisone is a love-hate drug, right? Everybody hates it, uh, but it is needed, at least initially, in most cases, to control myositis. At the same time, it is a risk factor for atherosclerosis, prednisone use, right? And so then you have all these other drugs that many of you may know about. Uh, and whenever I start uh, with a patient who has active myositis, dermatomyositis, or polymyositis, I'm going to exclude inclusion body myositis at this point, I am always using one of these other agents, and a lot of times combination therapy, with the prednisone, because I want to get rid of the prednisone as fast as I can. Um, and then modifiable cardiovascular risk factors. Blood pressure, if it's running high in the office and you notice it, you check it at home and you bring them in and you show them to the doctor. The doctor should be monitoring that, but I'm surprised how many times I'm providing hypertensive medications to my patients, right? They don't want to go see their other doctor. They're seeing me. I take care of it. Hypercholesterolemia, we're going to talk about a bit more. Diabetes, and again, uh, nobody smokes. Everybody has already stopped. Okay. I mean that. Oh, I get mean. I'm like a nice person until it gets to that, and I get really, really mean. Um, okay. So this is uh, a question regarding use of cholesterol-lowering medications in patients with myositis, right? These are the, the myositis specialists, I call them geeks, myself included. Um, and on and the y-axis, you have the percent of the responders that first have patients on lipid-lowering therapy. I was pretty surprised, it's 75%. 
93% of these experts reported that statins were the most commonly used agent that they use. Um, and about 70 some percent had over five patients on lipid lowering therapy. And then what, we've got 40% greater than 10 patients on lipid lowering therapy. Again, these are myositis patients, right? Myositis experts reporting that. So this is uh, coming to the end here of my, my chat. This is a little algorithm we put together recently uh, for a book chapter. Patient with idiopathic inflammatory myopathy, that includes polymyositis, dermatomyositis, inclusion body myositis, all of them. First thing, full clinical history. We went over that. Family history, cardiovascular risk factors, et cetera. It's a given, right? If there is a strong family history there, cardiology referral, consideration of further testing, including a stress test. Can't reinforce that enough. A stress test is what tells you, oh, you might have a blockage there. They blow it open, no problem. Versus, up, oh, I have a heart attack while I'm at Ralph's. That's a grocery store in California. I apologize to the rest of you. <laughs> Bigger problem, OK? Blood pressure and glucose assessment every visit, right? My patients come in, they get their blood pressure checked. They get a chemistry panel. I see both of those. Every doctor should see those. And then a lipid panel with a, and I apologize, there's a typo here quantitative LDL if not fasting. So not everybody comes in fasting to doctor's appointments, but you can still get a very good lipid profile with using a quantitative LDL to check your bad cholesterol. Even if you had a hamburger before you walked in the door, you can know what your cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, which is one of the most important, is. And that's just because of the way they do the assay. Um, and then those, those uh, things need to be addressed, right? One thing to look, action has to be taken. And then, of course, we talked about the echo and the EKG. And those need to be repeated <laughs> if they're abnormal. There's additional testing that can be done, uh, and we talked about that. OK, so we're going to get to the questions and discussion. I'm going to start it off with a very good question uh, I had from the online chat that was done a few months ago. Um, this patient says, I have extremely high cholesterol that does not lower with diet and exercise. I'm on Lipitor, which is also a Torvastatin, 80 milligrams. My cardiologist told me I need it. Is there any other treatment? OK. What did I say? Well, I said yes. Uh, there are other treatments. However, most doctors consider statins, which is the type of drug Lipitor is, of course, the first line therapy. Um, the caveat, of course, is that if you have an HMGCR antibody, uh, you can never take a statin, and we can talk more about that if some of you uh, have questions. Also, if you're one of the people who just does not tolerate statins, of course you cannot take a statin. The reason statins are used first line is because they have had such large and multiple clinical trials showing the benefit on solid cardiovascular outcomes, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, uh, a study not done that long ago was called Jupiter and actually showed patients just with a little bit of inflammation, didn't even have particularly high cholesterol levels, had a marked benefit in, in reducing cardiovascular mortality. They had to stop uh, the study early. So that's why cardiologists are pushing these things. Uh, they do have data to support them. Other things, and then we'll get into your questions, there are other treatments. Uh, there are caveats to the other treatments, and the global picture I will give you is that every agent which alters uh, lipid levels can have some adverse effects on muscle. Okay, You can look at all of them, and it's true. We are individuals. We all have different genetic components to us, and we will all respond differently to different agents. Uh, this last group here, which are antibodies, very interesting. Uh, target a protein called P uh, PCSK9. Uh, I don't know that they have side effects on muscle. They are more recently um, approved, and uh, we'll, we'll see more as the data comes forward on that. They're being given only to the very specific patient groups at present. So listed here, the bile acid uh, sequestrants, you know, they can have some GI issues. They're really for mild to mo moderate elevations in cholesterol. 
niacin, my problem with that comes with the flushing uh, a lot of times. Zetia, a fair number of my patients have used Zetia. Uh, it is um, a cholesterol absorption inhibitor, uh, works along the intestine. And then I mentioned the PCS K9 inhibitors, which are these monoclonal antibodies, really neat, inhibiting a protein called the CSK9, and therefore lowering uh, the LDL cholesterol by uh, interfering with the LDL uh, receptor in the liver. So, the floor is yours. What questions? I think I have to, oh no, he's got one back there. I'm gonna bring, you, I'm gonna bring the microphone to you. The UCLA Bruin, of course, should have the first question. I'm a Bruin because Christina is my physician. I come, I come, it's a disclaimer, I come from New York to visit Christina in Los Angeles, um, which should be a recommendation enough. My, my, uh, um, affinity for her. Uh, just a personal story. Uh, I had been taking niacin to reduce cholesterol because I can't tolerate any kind of statin. My CPK goes through the sky with statins. Um, Christina noticed I had been on niacin for two years, during which time my CPK went up. We stopped uh, niacin about six weeks ago and my CPK fell 400 points. Wow. So um, not all of these medications that advertise themselves as being homeopathic or natural are good for you. So that's my point. Thank you for that. Um, so I had, well, I had a heart attack in 2001, and then about just before I got diagnosed with IBM, um, they noticed the CK was really high. And what happened was, so they took me off the statins, mm -hmm. and I wasn't on any cholesterol medicine and all. And then I went through that whole battery of tests that you have, and everything came back normal. And then I had a heart attack. And I had, had the test. A, a second heart attack. I had a second heart attack last September. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I was off the statins off. Yeah. And and, and, and he did everything. They did yeah. my alcohol monitor. Yeah. I had the stress yeah. test. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Like, and they went to the hospital and said, I'm having a heart attack. Yeah. I could feel the chest yeah. pain. They did an EKG and said, oh, it's perfectly normal. Yeah. There's yeah. no way, there's not even yeah. a sign that you ever yeah. had a heart attack. And I finally had to convince the doctor that, you know, could you do a troponin test? Yeah. Because I'm having a heart attack. Yeah. The nurse gave me a tranquilizer. Yeah. She yeah. thought I was stressed. Yeah. And then while I was there, I said, oh, you're not all. Then the troponin was elevated. Just, you're not only like having a minor heart attack, you're having a major heart attack now. Yeah. And they did um, the stents in the middle of the night. So now I've been to a lipid specialist in Canada. And I'm on easy death, and I'm back on statins because they say, well, you've got a choice. If you don't take the statins, you'll be dead, and it won't matter what you want. So, so did you, the first question I have, now I, I'll address that because it's a great point. You should be up here doing it. It's a beautiful point. It's a beautiful point. This is, this is a very gloss over to say, make your doctors pay attention, right? And these tests have such limitations, right? So you're, it's a beautiful point. You should have done the presentation for me. Here's what I, what I want to ask. Why were you taken off the statin in the first place? Because this is a really big point in the room. Because your CK was high. And I get a phone call at 12.30 a.m. in the morning from the whoever does the testing and said, well, the phone rang and answered the phone. He said, I'm from the lab. You need to go to the hospital now because you're having a... And I said, I was yeah, sleeping yeah, and I was yeah, fine until yeah. you woke me up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so, so that's, that's, that's the point that I want to bring up is that all of, all of these tests, that, I have two points. All of these tests, you're absolutely on target. They can't find everything. But the biggest thing, in my opinion, that could have helped you was back when they took you off the statins, if they hadn't have taken you off the statins. Exactly. That was the problem. Um, uh, the tests are just trying to make somebody feel better, right, by testing. You know, there's a... 
there are a fair amount of things that are found in patients on those tests, but then, as you point out, a lot of it's not. That, the problem was when they took you off the statins. A very interesting point that I didn't put in this uh, discussion was, they have done, I told you, all of these huge statin trials, right? And they're doing them, I told you, Jupiter, just patients who have a little bit of CRP elevation in their blood, right? So they don't have any horrible risk factors. They're just a little bit elevated in their inflammation level. And there are a lot of heart attacks happening in those patients that are prevented by the statins. But any CK blip, people get completely scared, right? And the statins are, I mean, I've got my patients with rheumatoid arthritis who I talk, we've got to get you on your statin. You know, they've got carotid plaque, part of our program in the lab. They say, Christina, my joints hurt, and now you want to give me muscle aches. You're awesome, right? You know, there's just this banner that, that these things are horrible, but this is a case in point of what happens uh, because of that. The last thing I want to say, and then we'll get to more questions, is they have done these huge clinical trials in statins. They have checked baseline CKs in patients who have not had any myositis, any statin yet, right? They're just patients entering a clinical trial, various degrees of cardiovascular risk, and about 30% of them have an abnormal CK, right? 30% of people not on statins, not with myositis, have an abnormal CK, right? So in any case, I won't blab on. More questions? <coughs> What's Chris? My question is if you had a, um, a heart attack, mm -hmm. the cardiology world has a tendency to treat you like a uh, herd of horses and not a zebra. So the big question I want to find out, because I had one in March, as you know. Um, how often should stress tests be the nuclear testing and those type of thing versus somebody without traumatic life It's a great question. I don't think I know the answer. I don't think anybody's done the study to look at it. Um, there's going to be, I mean, the answer is I don't know. It's a beautiful question. I don't think cardiology knows. I think the most important thing is that they're just aggressively reducing your risk. Now, how often are they checking it in you? Post, because you're in the herd, herd of horses. So how, what does that mean? Yeah, so the first, uh, I had up the uh, MI in March, and then in June, went through stress tests, um, um, and uh, echo, you know, obviously echo with that, and then MRI. Okay. Luckily, my heart muscle, there's and they no plan for repeat in six months? Uh, I believe I'll find that out in a couple yeah. weeks when I see the cardiologist again. I, I mean, I, I would push for six months. You know, that's a, the clinical judgment call. What I would say is, you know, a stress echo, there's, there's minimal risk involved, right? If you're in a monitored setting, they're putting goop on your heart and they're stressing you, you know? And the same with MRI. Uh, if they're not even using gadolinium, there's minimal... Uh, invasiveness to those procedures. Uh, and I think you just, I'd be happy to talk to your cardiologist. <coughs> I've stacked the audience, uh, as you can see. Uh, so I, I, the answer is I don't know, because there isn't data to suggest it. But I think the more aggressive monitoring, the better. And then if you have anything that's off to you, if you're feeling more fatigued, and we all have fatigue, and with myositis, that's even worse. But if something is different, you got to be right in there telling them that something is different, right? And telling, even if it's not your cardiologist who's listening, telling somebody who's going to fight for you and get a hold of the cardiologist and nicely say, yep, or who'll order the test themselves. I mean, I have ordered stress echoes myself. Um, so, yes. I apologize if uh, you don't recover this. I unfortunately was a little late. Uh, I was told that there's a new scan, new technology, a scan that can determine uh, how much occlusion you have in your coronary arteries. And yeah. It's not invasive, but it's yeah. uh, very yeah. effective. Yeah. There, is, there is a CT angio that's done where they put in contrast and they can get a, a calcium score and also look at, get an idea of how much blockage is there. So it's a type of CAT scan with contrast. The only thing I caution you is make sure your kidneys are working and your fluids are on board, right? Because the, the, the contrast 
can be a little bit toxic to the kidneys. Uh, a patient of mine just got a low dose one, uh, both of the carotids and the coronaries done yesterday at UCLA, a low dose of the lower dose of the contrast, so you might ask about that. So it's a, a CT angiogram, a CAT scan with an angiogram so that they don't have to put the catheter in, they just shoot the dye. Um, and depending on the center, they're pretty good. They can get a really nice uh, visualization of the coronary arteries. And, and we're using some of those scans uh, for some of our research. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, um, we're dealing with statin-induced um, connectasin myopathy, um, plus a strong history of family heart disease and hypercholesterolemia. Any hope with the PCSK9 inhibitors? I think it's a great route to go. Uh, I have you know, already made some rumblings uh, with this company and uh, they're very interested in, in people like me who want to pursue this in terms of looking at it for my patients uh, with problems just like this because I, that disease is, can be so severe um, and the cardiovascular disease cannot be ignored. So I would push for it. I'm happy to talk to you about that. I actually uh, spoke uh, to people who make that drug about the problem and about studying patients and, and having patients get access to that drug, which has now been FDA approved for patients who have failed statins. You know, the approval is, is what dictates whether the insurance will pay for the drug. And these new biologics, which it is an antibody, are expensive. So I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. I think it's, it's a pathway that, that should be looked at. Hi. Um, Hi. I have polymyositis, and uh, I was diagnosed like five years ago, four years. I've had some of this before, but on my own, before I went to my neurologist, a neurologist, I went ahead and did a full cardiac workup on my own. I just thought, Good for there's you. something wrong with me, I need to figure this out. So when I went through the whole cardiac thing, everything turned out great. Um, I was good, all right? So now I'm four or five years into this um, disease and on different medications and stuff. But my ne neurologist has never brought up the fact that should I see a cardiologist again? What, what is the time frame? Should you just wait till you have like symptoms or you're feeling like awful and something like that? Or, or what, is, what is your recommendation? My first uh, comment would be, I'm sorry, you know, uh, <laughs> that's happened to you. I, I'm not surprised, though, you know, I, I mean, it's, like I said, the neurologist or the rheumatologist has got all these things on their plate, and depending on the specific physician, this is not even in their mind, not even in the slightest, you know, uh, and, and so I think you have to be proactive. I think you've got to yourself tackle all of the things uh, that were up there, you know, how's your blood pressure doing? Have your lipids been assessed? You know, how's your sugar looking on the labs? All of the basics, right? What's your family history? All of that, you and yourself have to kind of be a pro advocate for. It's not fair. Uh, it shouldn't be this way. We can talk about healthcare all day long, uh, but it is this way, and so we have to go after it. And then I have had plenty of patients who I've referred to the cardiologist, and patients dependent on their insurance can see a cardiologist, right? And the cardiologist is gonna to wanna to do something for you, so they're gonna to wanna to test you. Uh, otherwise, they have no point for you sitting in the office. So if it's been five years, there's some risk factors there, I would go ahead and get yourself evaluated. There's no reason not to, because as we've discussed, even with the evaluations, there can be problems. But a lot of scrutiny, and I, you guys may think I'm nuts, but take an article, take a good review article. We just published one that long ago. I, I can get you that. You know, I, I think the most effective thing is a patient, oh, doctors, depending on their good one, they'll love it. You take an article, go, hey, did you know that atherosclerosis is increased in patients with myositis? Here's an article for you, right? And then they go, wow, but you've actually taught them something to act, right? So I'll get some, some, some things together so we can have a follow-up on that. Um, there's not... take the article and highlight a few things and say in our next visit, yeah. can we talk about this? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So you're not putting yeah. them on the spot. You're not saying I know yeah. more than you do, but you say, I heard about this, you highlight the, the keys at the top paragraph and the conclusion. 
Mm -hmm. Whether it's exercise, physical therapy, cardiology. Yeah. yeah. I say. And and the and the good doctors they learn and they're kind of excited just like when I see somebody's patient as a second consult they work with me they're happy to do so you know and if they're real mean to you you should probably get a different doctor. Thank you. Right up here. I have two questions and the first one I think I should know what's the difference between CK and CPK? Same. Same thing, it's CK, it's a shortened for. Okay, my second question is, I heard you say, I try to get my patients off of prednisone as quickly as possible. Well, yes. I have polymyositis with lung involvement. I've been on prednisone 21 years yeah. at 10 milligrams. Yeah. And my rheumatologist here tried to cut me down last year. Yeah. I lost my yeah. breath, shortness yeah. of breath, yeah. and excelled. Yeah. Went back on prednisone and now I'm fine. Yeah. So I figured I could take it the rest of my life. Yeah, so there's a caveat there, and this was not a discussion on treatment, which, boy, if you want to hear me blab on, <laughs> lung disease is crucial. So if I get patients with lung disease, and every patient is different, but I will say there's a generality. Lung disease, it's very difficult to get down on the prednisone. You and I can have a discussion of what treatments you're on. Uh, if your doctor's here, they're probably a good doctor knowing what they're doing. Uh, but I find it very tough to get patients who have had lung disease off prednisone entirely. If I get them down to 10 milligrams or less, I'm not doing so bad. Because that can be such, and the biggest mistake, not necessarily the biggest, but one of my top three, when I see patients from other rheumatologists or neurologists who have bad myositis and lung disease, or just bad myositis, is they try and taper that prednisone too quickly. And the patient flares up, and that's a huge. So as much as we're doing a, a cardiac talk and I say we try and get prednisone quickly, you can't do it or you're going to kill somebody if you do it, uh, to be quite frank with you. You, you just can't. And t 10 milligrams of prednisone is a heck of a lot different than 40 and 50 and 60 milligrams, right? So lung disease, I'm not surprised that you haven't gotten off the prednisone. And are you going to be it, on it for the rest of your life? If you live to be a nice old 110-year-old gentleman, who cares? Make sure your bones are looked at. Make sure you're getting your cardiac monitor, your lipids, the whole nine yards. you got to live. So I appreciate that comment. <coughs> Just to piggyback on his statement in regards to prednisone, um, it is, as you mentioned, um, a drug, a blessing in disguise, mm -hmm. and horrid, mm -hmm. and other um, natures. And in my situation, this is my second conference. Last year we attended. Um, I had a severe flare. I was down to eight. Um, Mayo, Minnesota, nor Stanford um, were surprised that it was so hard for me. Um, I have IDL as well, and it also affects my heart. Um, I went back up to 80 when I was at 8. I went to our major um, top gun, which is Cytoxin. Um, IV or PO? IV or PO? Um, Did you get the infusions? Castle. It was Pills. suggested, yes. Good. It was suggested not to do the IV in that format. Um, but it's a... It's a hard drug, um, yeah. and I'm now down to seven. I'm still not out of the flare, mm -hmm. but I'm not on oxygen today as I was yeah. last year this time <coughs> consistently. So with prednisone, you have a lot of side effects, but yet there are things that we need respiratory-wise um, for that. And I am now, this summer, dealing with um, cataract surgery, mm -hmm. um, healing because of that. So yeah. if you can get down, our hope was zero. It doesn't look like that's the case, but it's better than 80. It's yeah. better than 20. Absolutely. And, and what I'll add to, to what you just said is, and I've, patients who have seen me in the audience, you know, go out because you've heard this a million times, you don't want to fight over milligram per milligram of prednisone. You just don't because you're a perfect example of what happened. Is you went back up to 80, right? And you wasted all of that toxicity on your body, right? Whereas if perhaps, and you can't second guess things. It sounds like you've got good doctors. But slowly, and if you hit a, a block at 10 milligrams, then stay there. 
And then after you stay there for a while and you feel back to your usual, pick off nine milligrams Monday and Wednesday. And the rest of the week do 10, right? And do that for a couple weeks and see how you do. And then pick off another day with nine and leave 10. You know what I'm saying? My, um, what I have learned about myositis over the last several years is that it can go into remission, but you can't have this seesaw effect where you let it flare up. You've got to get it controlled and leave it there. And what are you fighting after with seven versus eight milligrams of prednisone? You got the same thing that everybody gets, gets is, I hate prednisone and every milligram is a victory, right? And you want that victory. I got it, I got the number. Every milligram, you got something there. I had a great discussion. One of my patients was getting a, a bit down with the disease and everything. She really wanted to, to decrease the prednisone. It was a plus minus situation. I said, well, decreasing by half a milligram, lift your spirits enough to balance it, you know, just because of that we feel. But I mean it when I say, what are you doing when you're trying to get to seven when you should be at nine? Because the, you're going to do better over the long run if you keep that disease perfectly controlled with whatever means you need to do it and then slowly over months to years lower that because you don't ever want to go back up to 80 again and there's no reason to fight over two milligrams prednisone the side effect profile is going to be very similar at 10 versus at seven you're absolutely right and you know, there's people that have lung diseases and <coughs> scenarios yeah. One complements the other. So if one is angry, the yeah. other is going to go out. And because of all of this, I had a second ablation. So yeah. they're no fun, but you yeah. have to do what you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. I have to find out who your doctor is who gave you oral cytoxin because not many people will do it. I'm one of them. So I have to find the group. Who so. and where? Tell us. Um, I do. Locally, I live, again, in the state of California. We're considering retiring in Southern, so LA is one of the options. But I'm in the Bay Area, meaning San Francisco, so I deal with Stanford. Oh, yeah. So do I. Oh. I have oral cytoxin at National Jewish and Denver. Good, good. Now we, we uh, we're putting together a paper of about 13 patients treated with oral cytoxin. Some of those had the HMGCR. Uh, antibody. Four of them were um, in wheelchairs uh, with their necrotizing myositis or their polydermatomyositis and got out of wheelchairs with oral cytoxin. Some of them had failed IV already. So it can, it's a potent drug, you've got to use it correctly, but can, has really helped my patients uh, over the years. And I don't find many doctors when I get these referrals knowing about it and using it. So that's why I was interested. Uh, well, I'm part of Dr. Christine's ex-audience. Um, <laughs> I told uh, you I stacked it. I'm from San Diego, right here, and I had doctors locally that didn't know what they were doing, so my wife found Dr. Christine online. And to, to kind of talk about the prednisone thing, I, they, keep, they kept lowering me by five milligrams, and I was not doing well doing that. So once we got to Dr. Christine, she said, look, I got to fight five milligrams. So we started doing it one at a time, and, I'm at my lowest dose of prednisone since I've been diagnosed. So it does make a difference. And getting the right people does make a difference. So I can tell you that she's awesome. And if you're anywhere in California, I would go. There are about uh, 12 minutes left. You can start thinking about filling out your evaluation forms. Thank you. So I have DM, and it was just diagnosed eight weeks ago, but I've been suffering with it since 2011. And so the first thing my doctor did, which I'm so grateful for my doctor, she actually said, I'm baking her a big pie this next visit because she was so awesome. You know, Yay! Yay! So like we like pie, food! Like, <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I love baking pies. So when I went to right away she took me off statin. I've been on a statin since uh, 2012. It's a very low dose of Crestar, two and a half milligrams daily. But she said, I want to take you off of this right away. We may put you back on later. but. What's your thoughts about that? Because I do have, yeah. have yeah. A, I have a high calcium score. Yeah. I have, I, through diet and exercise and all sorts of strategies, I'm able to lower my calcium score. But uh, I'm worried about not being on the yeah. staff. Okay, so it's a great point. The bottom line, and that I'm going to go like this and chit chat all about it, but the bottom line is make sure you put it on your calendar 
to have that sit down of can I go back on my statin, okay? It is, and put it on the calendar, put it a couple places in case you forget or the appointment get rescheduled, put it on the calendar to have that discussion. Whatever you gotta do, couple places. I have very commonly had the same experience. I think doctors are, are seeing patients with myositis and they're a statin and there's a conflict there and so they just take it off because they don't want to have anything jading the picture, right? If you go online, you can find case reports, somebody developed dermatomyositis related to a statin, right? And, it, and that's the gun jerk reflex everywhere. Uh, if you did not have a problem with the statin before, the likelihood that that is any way related to your dermatomyositis diagnosis, in my opinion, is very low. Um, when somebody comes to me, their statin has been taken off, they just got diagnosed with myositis or their myositis is active, do I put it back on right away? No, but it's right there in my notes so that in a few months when they're doing fine, it goes back on, right? You can check a blood test and look at CK. That'll even sometimes, well, we won't go there. It just has to be done. So put it on the calendar. You got to do it uh, because I don't think if this was going on for years and you developed dermatomyositis, the likelihood the two are connected. But I see it all the time. It's a gun, gun jerk reflex. What IBM? IBM. Uh, I don't think there is any data that statins are linked to the development of IBM. And if you have IBM and you have risk for cardiovascular disease, you need to discuss. Uh, statin use or another agent use and if your cholesterol is high you have the risk you can't ignore it because you have a muscle disease that you can't take a statin those two things are not mutually exclusive there's a big thought press process that they are right? and, and it's just the level of depth into it is not thought of enough by most physicians right that's the first thing that to do, take her off the statin. absolutely it, it happens all the time uh, because they don't want anything, but if you've got biopsy-proven inclusion body myositis, and that's the disease, yes, your CK may be 800, typically is, 500 to 1,000, that's where they run. Doesn't mean you can't have a statin. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't be followed once that statin gets initiated or whatever cholesterol. That's a different story. Doesn't mean you can't have intolerance to it or can't worsen your disease. It could, okay? so. Just like Herb was saying, there's, it could, you gotta, you gotta monitor. Just like there's a fair number of patients without myositis who don't tolerate statins. And we'll pick on the statins to keep it simple, right? There are patients who go into full rhabdomyolysis and have to be admitted to the hospital for uh, hydration, right? CK shoots up to 15,000. They don't have myositis. They just don't tolerate a statin. So regardless, you have to be monitored very carefully because you could be one of those people forgetting the IBM, but you can't ignore the fact that you have cardiovascular risk if you do. You can't ignore the lipids just because you have a muscle disease diagnosis. Case in point right there. Over here. Over here. Hi. Hi. Um, I was diagnosed with ADM uh, a couple months ago, and um, my, heart, my um, blood pressure is normal, but one of the things I've noticed is that my, uh, my heart rate has gone up, and so it used to be 60 to 70, now yeah. it's like 90 to 100. Yeah. Is that something that I, th I think you'd, I think you still need to point it out to your doctors. Uh, at least have them do an EKG and an echo. You have amyopathic DM, right? That's what ADM stands for. Everybody caught it. Uh, that's a tricky diagnosis. And just because I talk too much for my own good, it's amyopathic right now, you don't feel anything. It doesn't mean that it's completely amyopathic, right? You don't, you can't assume that it is. Nobody can stamp you and know inside each myocyte in your heart that there's no involvement, right? And ADM can be associated with lung disease and other issues, right? So all of these diseases, whether at a moment you don't have muscle involvement or you do, they're systemic processes, right? Uh, which is why ADM patients can get lung disease. They don't have muscle disease, but they can get lung disease. And if your heart rate's different, nobody can tell you for sure that there's no muscle involvement, even though you have that label, uh, right? Uh, and there are all sorts of discussions on how to classify a myopathic DM. You know, I have had, unfortunately, patients who are really profoundly weak, but their CK is normal. They may even have a normal MRI. They're, they're not crazy. They have muscle weakness, even though the, the assays that we have to assess the muscle are not good enough at this stage, right? So I would look into it. I, you know your body, it sounds like, very well. 
Um, and I would keep an eye on it. Unfortunately, we got to push doctors, right? You just got to keep up with it. How, does it, how, does it, how would you treat it? Is it something that you can't treat? Well, you know, first of all, I'm pushing for you to, to recognize it, to get a value of treating tachycardia. And if your heart rate's running higher, there can be other factors, right? Prednisone is a main factor that'll drive heart rates up, right? Uh, the stress of the illness is another factor that can drive your, heart, your resting heart rate to be higher than it is. So there are plenty of other things that are more common. And, you know, I do a lot of testing, a lot of addressing risk factors, but then you also have to look at common things, okay? So stress, prednisone, you know, the whole diagnosis and things can also drive a resting heart rate to be a little bit higher. So you do, you do the assessments and then you continue to monitor. One of the smartest people I've ever met, who's about 88 years old right now, uh, once told me, Christina, I was never smart enough to get in the first visit, right? This man is brilliant. Um, and it was the greatest thing he could ever say, right? So persistence, right? Even great doctors might not get it initially, but you go back and you go back. And when I have sick DM, PM, IBM, when I have a sick patient, I may see them every week initially to get them on track if they live nearby, right? So. Hi. I've been managing IBM for the last 11 years, uh, more serious symptoms of dysphagia. Yeah. So I've been one of the few, I think, who gets results from prednisone. Um, my cholesterol became high, and so my rheumatologist said, no statin. Zevia. I've never worried about my heart. I've always said all I have to worry about is the IVM. Should I be looking for a cardiologist? Because my rheumatologist and neurologist yeah. aren't tracking. I, I don't think there's any harm if you got the time, you got the money for parking, to go see a cardiologist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's no downside. I'll get some recommendations maybe to the San Francisco yeah, I, or Yes, now. yes. And, and they and a lot of them are quite nice, and they're very interested, a lot of times, in patients with autoimmune disease and myositis. This is just a quick question. I have a hard time swallowing, and they give me an 80 milligram, milligram of atorvastatin. Atorvastatin? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I can't swallow. So tell them to give you the tiny oh. one. <laughs> Why not? Well, do they have tiny room? They have all dosages, 10, 20, Check it out. The pharmacists are often your best friends. I have patients who sell they don't like a family, they don't like a 500, so they take a million, two fifty just to get the smaller pill, right? So I don't know off the top of my head, but they have 10 milligram, but even if you have to take eight tens, right? It doesn't matter. Um, they have find out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You went over his saying so fast, I didn't hear it. Oh, it? He said, Christina, I was, we were talking about patients and diagnosis and care. And he said, Christina, I was never smart enough to figure it out the first time. I mean, the first time the patient came in who was complex and had a lot of problems, I was never smart enough to figure it out. Right? This guy is brilliant. He's smart enough, but his point is, not every doctor can get everything the first time. I mean, complicated illnesses with comorbidities and things that you got to keep going back and be proactive and, and give them a chance because a, a good doctor is going to keep getting better and keep knowing you better. Um, and, and you're Dr. Christine, I got started on STEM, you say, about four months ago, and I felt a big difference in my muscles. The pain was there, it was fine on me, and so my doctor stopped. You mean it got worse? It got worse, yeah. and I know my baseline very well because I'm now on tapering doses of Imran, and I'm on 25 milligrams now. So I don't, my CK level is never raised, but my, my primary physician said, I guess my, I can't remember my numbers, but they don't probably I'm going to stop time. you before you go any further because sure. I'm good. I'm good. At the same time that your muscle symptoms got worse, you're also on tapering doses of Imran. Yeah, no, he just started tapering now. This was about four months ago. I was on 50 milligrams. I just started the tapering now. I've been on 50 milligrams of Imran for about four years now. Okay, and, and why? Uh, 50 milligrams is not a big dose of Imran, right? Yeah. And why, why is your disease in complete remission? I think so. So you're testing whether that's the only drug you're on, and you're testing whether you can get rid of it. Yeah, that's what he's trying to do. Yeah. 
because I've been on it for since 2012 now. I was on high doses of prednisone. I cut that off. Totally for about a year. After so you're only 50, 50 milligrams of inurin. Oh, yeah. yeah, and you're perfect. There's no excess fatigue. You have. You said dermatomyositis or polymyositis. Okay. There's no problems whatsoever. You don't know if you have the disease. So your doctor is saying, what can we get off of it? You're on such a low dose, can you get off of it? Right? And so it's tapering. Yeah. And you're saying everything was stable before you started the statin. Mm -hmm. okay. And meaning, as you've been on the statin, he hasn't tapered the in your end at the same time. No, no. Okay. It, it was my primary physician that uh, prescribed the statin. Okay. Yeah. So I, and so you know, almost immediately, I felt something. So. He stopped that my primary position. He says it's not that bad either. You know, okay. I got the number. So, but when should I think about it? Maybe now that these are my you know, more risk factors involved, that I should restart that statin and try or if there's stuff muscle friendly, yeah. non statin. As I mentioned, all of the drugs and the PCSD9 are the on the bug that maybe, but. You need to readdress it. You may be one of the people who just doesn't tolerate statins well. There are also different types of statins, hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So depending what statin you are on, sometimes a different one. Yeah, so cravastatin is an old one. You might consider that one. But you may just be a person who doesn't tolerate that class of drug. Sometimes the different statins do make a difference. So cravastatin tends to be works less effectively, but also has less kind of side effects. There's a large group of patients who don't tolerate them without my studies. And then you gotta look at the other options. Thank you so much. Glad you're doing well, right? Thank you. Maybe you have one more question. And then we'll be done. Are you doing any other sessions? No, I have to do a deep talk. <laughs> five minutes for the science symposium with the NAB. And then uh, I'll be at the NAB uh, board tomorrow morning answering questions for the whole audience. So I'll be up there. Doing so I believe that you recommend advanced lipid testing every six months or, or once a year, correct? Six to twelve months, absolutely. Okay, so if you don't have any techniques if your insurance says we're going to pay for that test once every five years. Are there any techniques for coding to get insurance? Oh, that's a great that. question. Uh, you know, certainly you can be put at elevated cardiovascular risk, right? You know, the coding for a high-risk category is certainly warranted given the, you know, the data and the autoimmune disease is well recognized. But you haven't run into that? In I haven't run into that. That's one of the things I do get paid for. Thank you very much, Thanks, everybody. Guys. is Chris Harris. I have uh, dermatomyositis. I was first diagnosed in 2005. So this is my 12th year and this is my first year to this meeting, which I'm kicking myself for, but going forward I'll be at every one. Um, my favorite part of this meeting is meeting the patients and their advocates and I'm amazed at the support that I've received since I've been here from everybody. And I love that people have shared their stories, no matter how challenging, but I love the idea of hope for everybody. And my second favorite part of this meeting is the individuals have, who have donated their time to move this disease forward and try to find a cure, which includes everybody with the Myositis Foundation as well as the panel. Every person who has volunteered their time, the physicians, the physical therapists, the volunteers, and the fact that they've committed to do this as they move forward is amazing to me and I love it and I will be here again next year and the year after that and it just gives me a lot of hope when I was very depressed. So thank you for inviting us, thank you for supporting it and I look forward to seeing everybody next year. Hello, my name is Anastasia Victorson and I came here all the way from Stockholm, Sweden. I'm very happy to be here. Is this of course, your first time coming to the <laughs> To this conference, yes, to the TMA conference the first time. What's it been like? It's been fantastic, very informative. I've met my friends, my Facebook friends, and uh, I think, I hope I'll be able to come again. Um, I have polymyositis, but I also have a syndrome that's called the anti-synthesis syndrome. Uh, I have a
have antibodies, a lot of them, but anti jo one is the most common one. And I also have ILD, quite serious. But getting medication, feeling quite okay. The doctor saved my life, yeah. Very good information. And it's also nice to see the persons, I read a lot. It's also nice to see them in real life, to be able to interact with the doctors. Yes, I'm just happy to be here, having met you too. Take care. And everybody else that hasn't been here, hasn't gotten a chance, please try, because this was really worth it. It's beyond my expectations, really. Thank you.